Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On Huskies! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush, with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Listen to this sound picture. Ah. Mm. Oh, boy. Yes, that's what it sounds like around the breakfast table when folks first try rich, thick cream and fruit on a heaping bowl of Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. It's a breakfast deluxe. Taste it. Every spoonful of those king-sized grains of wheat or rice is mouth-watering good. So crisp, so nut-like in flavor... So extra delicious, all covered with velvety, smooth, rich cream. Don't wait. Enjoy this deluxe treat tomorrow morning. Taste tempting Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. (music) Elaine McNeil sat at her father's bedside. The lamplight shed a soft glow over the gaunt features of the dying man. Duncan McNeil was saying... So, young Phil Rockton is coming to call again tonight. Yes. He said he'd be around about 8 o'clock. He's a mighty persistent young fellow. How many times has he asked you to marry him? Twice. And I reckon he'll ask you again tonight. Well, I... I don't know. Listen, Elaine... Before I die, I want you to promise me one thing. Yes, Father? I reckon you know what I'm going to ask. You want me to forget Tom Beckett and marry Phil? Yes, that's it. But how can I marry Phil, Father, when when I'm still in love with Tom? Tom's dead, Elaine. It's nearly six months now since you got that message from the War Department... Surely that's time enough to get over your grief. Please, Dad. Uh, I know it's painful to talk about it, but you've got to face up to the situation. When I'm gone, the mine will belong to you. You'll be a rich girl. You'll need a man at your side to help you run things, especially in a rough country like the Yukon. Do you think that's a good reason for marrying someone I don't love? Well, love will come in time, Elaine. After you've been partners for a while. The important thing is that Phil's a good, dependable young fella. He's smart, and he's got plenty of gumption. He's chief bookkeeper at the bank right now. In another year or two, they'll be making him assistant manager... Yes, Phil will get ahead in the world. No doubt about that. And if you and Phil get married, I know I'll be leaving you in good hands. All right, Dad. I'll do what you say. If Phil proposes again tonight, I'll accept. It was more than a week later in the town of Selkirk. The Goldust Cafe was crowded with sourdoughs and trappers. One corner of the room, a young man sat alone at a table eating dinner. He looked up as an elderly prospector approached his table. Hey, mind if I sit down here with you? The other tables are all filled up. Oh, of course not. Pull up a chair. Yeah, thanks. You uh, prospecting around these parts? No. Just on my way to Dawson. Say, is that a Dawson newspaper you've got stuck in your pocket? Yes, the latest issue of the Klondike Nugget. Oh, would you mind if I took a look at it? I haven't seen a copy of the Nugget for almost a year. Why, sure. Go ahead and read it. (laughs) You've been outside the territory for a while? Yes, I was in the American Army down in Cuba. 
Hmm. Well, looks like the nugget's gotten to be quite a newspaper. I guess Dawson must have grown a lot since I saw it last. <laughs> it sure has. You won't recognize the place. Hey, waiter, how about giving me some service? Be right there. Hmm. Well, they've even got a column of social notes. Holy smoke. What's the matter, son? Oh, nothing. I just saw an item about a girl I know getting married. Hey, what'll it be, Sardo? I want a steak about this thick, smothered with onions. Sure, coming right up. Uh, hey, uh, wait a minute. How much do I owe you? Well, let's see. Uh, four... yeah, that'll be three fifty. Here, uh, keep the change. Oh, thanks. Hey, you ain't going yet, are you? You ain't even finished your meal. Uh, well, I guess I'm not as hungry as I thought I was. So long, old timer. With good weather all the way and the trail hard packed, the trip from Selkirk to Dawson was completed in five days. Phil Rockland was preparing to turn in for the night when he heard a dog team halting outside his cabin. A moment later, someone knocked on the door. Yes, what is... No, it can't be. But it is, Phil. Tom Beckett. In the flesh. Oh, do you mind if I come in? <laughs> Why, no. Come on. Golly, Tom. I still can't believe it. I guess it must be quite a shock at that. I thought you were killed down in Cuba. Well, the War Department thought so, too. Hey, here, uh, give me your park. I'll hang it up. Uh, thanks, Phil. Uh, sit down, Tom. Now, for the love of Mike, tell me what happened. Well, there's not much to tell. I got shot down by a sniper during a jungle skirmish. Some natives picked me up and nursed me for a couple of weeks. Finally, one of them got word through to the American lines. A couple of corpsmen came and hauled me out on a stretcher. By that time, I'd been reported dead. But good heavens, why didn't you uh, write and tell us you were safe? Well, in the first place, I was delirious for quite a while. Caught some kind of jungle fever. After I pulled through that, it looked like they'd have to amputate my leg. Well, if that happened, I figured maybe I'd better let Elaine go on thinking I was dead. You darn fool. Oh, I guess you're right. Anyway, I was lucky. The doctors finally managed to save my leg. And now you... Here you are. I know what you're thinking, Phil. What do you mean? You're wondering what's going to happen now that I'm back. You see, I read that notice in the paper about you and Elaine being engaged. Oh? oh Tom, I, I... I don't know what to say. Uh, never mind. I don't blame you for falling in love with her. What I want to know is whether Elaine's in love with you. Have you talked to her yet? No, I came straight here to your cabin as soon as I got to Dawson. Do you want the truth? Phil, you're my best friend. I know you won't lie to me, so just give it to me straight. Elaine and I fell in love less than a month after you went back to the States to enlist. Oh, I see. Tom, I, I'm i sorry it had to happen this way. Oh, don't be silly. It's not your fault. What do you figure on doing? Oh, I don't know. This sort of changes all my plans. Say, listen, Tom... Would you like to do a little prospecting? Oh, what do you mean? Well, the bank just got word this morning about a new gold strike up in Malamute Valley. The news hasn't gotten around yet, so if you were to head up there right away before the stampede starts, you could probably stake yourself out a nice claim. Hmm, by golly, that's an idea. There's nothing to keep me around Dawson any longer. I'll stock up on supplies and start tomorrow morning. Good. Uh, you're not planning on seeing Elaine before you go. What's the use? No, Tom, you can give her my best regards. Tell her I wish both of you lots of happiness. Why, sure, Tom, I'll do that. Sergeant Preston was returning from a northern patrol. About ten miles from Dawson, he stopped to prepare his midday meal. As he busied himself over the campfire, a traveler approached and braked his sled to a halt. King greeted the newcomer with a series of friendly barks. King, old fellow. I might have known you wouldn't forget me. Hello, Sergeant. Tom Beckett. I'm not seeing things, am I? I'm not a ghost, if that's what you're thinking. But you were reported killed in action. Uh, I was wounded and couldn't get back to my outfit. My company officer figured I was dead. Instead of which, you're back safe and sound. Yep, back from the grave. Well, I can't offer you any fatted calf, Tom, but I can fix you a plate of beans. <laughs> Find yourself a place and sit down. Thanks, Sergeant, but I ate just before I left Dawson. Huh? Well... 
take a cup of coffee, though, if you, if you don't, don't mind. Why, of course. There you go. Thanks. I suppose Elaine McNeil's mighty happy you're back. Well, I haven't seen her. Well, I thought you two were engaged. Well, we were, but she changed her mind while I was gone. She's going to marry Phil Rockland. The wedding's set for tomorrow morning. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. Is that why you're leaving, Dawson? Well, it's one of the reasons. I'm on my way to Malamute Valley. I'm hoping to get there before the stampede starts. Stampede? Well, I didn't even know anyone was prospecting over that way. Oh, it's just a new strike. Phil Rockland found out about it through the bank, and he was the one who passed the word along to me. I see. Well, Tom, you haven't had a very happy homecoming. Here's hoping you'll have better luck in Malamute Valley. Meanwhile, Phil Rockland had left the bank at lunchtime and gone to the Northern Lights Cafe. He went to the back of the cafe and knocked on a door marked private. Come in. The owner of the cafe, a man named Frisco Dunn, was seated at his desk. Well, what do you want, Rockland? You ready to pay off some of your IOUs? You'll get paid with plenty of interest, too, just as soon as I take over old man McNeil's mine. And better not be any slip-ups. There won't be, providing you find someone to do a certain job for me. What kind of a job? The less you know about it, the better. Oh, oh, that kind, huh? It's got to be handled in a hurry. Can you find someone for me? Uh, let's see. Here, there's a fellow named Bronson might do. He's out in the cafe right now. He's got a half-breed pal. All right. Send them into the back room so I can talk to them. Yeah. And while you're at it... Yeah? You'd better tell them my credit's good. A few moments later, Bronson and the half-breed entered the back room where Phil Rockland was waiting for them. Frisco said you wanted to see us. I've got a job for you. I'll pay you $500 right now. And another 1000 later on. That is, of course, if the job is completed successfully. Sounds fair enough, Avery. Yeah. What do we have to do? A fellow named Tom Beckett is on his way to Malamute Valley. He just left town this morning. That means he'll make camp for the night somewhere near Devil's Gorge. Gone. You two start after him. You'll probably get to his camp sometime tonight after he's turned in. When you get there, grab him and knock him out. No gunplay? No gunplay. What do we do with him after we've knocked him off? You'll heave his body over the edge into the gorge. That way it'll look just like an accident. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I see what you mean. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Yeah. A bullseye for flavor. Yes, in every spoonful of the ready-to-serve breakfast cereals shot from guns, you enjoy swell nut-like flavor. A bullseye for crispness. Yes, there's tender melt-in-your-mouth crispness in those king-size kernels of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. A bullseye for nourishment. Yes, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice give you added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. You're always on the target when you reach for that famous big red and blue package with the smiling Quaker man on the front. Pour out a bowl full of crisp, delicious Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Add milk or cream, top with your favorite fruit. Man, oh man, these giant flavor-rich premium grains are exploded up to eight times normal size to make them crisp and tender. They're shot from guns to make them bigger and better tasting. Shot through and through with nut-like flavor, too. Buy both delicious kinds. For variety, eat Quaker puffed wheat one time, Quaker puffed rice the next. Just remember, they're never sold in bags or bulk. You can't miss with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. The famous cereals shot from guns. Now, to continue our story. When Sergeant Preston arrived in Dawson, he reported to Mounted Police Headquarters. A short time later, he was called into Inspector Maynard's office. Oh, Sergeant, I have another assignment for you. It's been a new gold strike. Oh, yes, sir. I heard about that. 
Is that so? I didn't think the news had leaked out yet. First claim was just filed about an hour ago. That's funny. Well, anyway, in another day or two, the usual rush will get underway. I think I'd better send a police detachment to keep order. You'll be in charge, Sergeant. Very well, sir. Has the valley ever been mapped? The valley? The Malamute Valley, the place where the gold strike occurred. The strike's not in the Malamute Valley. It's down on Campbell Creek. What's that? Inspector, are you sure there hasn't been a strike in Malamute Valley? Of course I'm sure. The commissioner's office always notifies us as soon as a claim is filed in a new district. Well, in that case, maybe I'd better tell you the whole story, sir. A couple of hours ago... Sergeant Preston told the inspector about his meeting with Tom Beckett. He explained how Tom had started out for Malamute Valley on a tip from Phil Rockland. When he was through, the inspector remarked, Sounds as though Rockland deliberately sent Tom on a wild goose chase. It certainly does. Inspector, you're a pretty good friend of Duncan McNeil's, aren't you? I've known him ever since he came up here. Have you seen him since he's been ill? Yes, several times, but what are you driving at? Well, I was just wondering, sir. You've had a chance to observe Elaine. Is she really in love with Phil Rockland? I doubt it very much. Frankly, I think she's just marrying him to please her father. I wonder if that's why Rockland wanted Tom out of the way. What do you mean, Sergeant? The wedding's set for tomorrow morning, sir. Perhaps Phil was afraid Elaine would call off the wedding if she found out that Tom was still alive. By George, I'll bet you're right. Inspector, can you spare me long enough to go after Tom? I'll travel all night and be back in town tomorrow morning ready for duty. Hmm. Well, Sergeant, the Northwest Mounted isn't in the Yukon to play <laughs> Cupid, but... Uh... Go to it. Thank you, sir. Devil's Gorge was a narrow, steep-walled chasm several miles long. The trail to Malamute Valley lay along the western edge of the gorge. It was late at night, and a full moon had risen by the time the two hired killers came in sight of Tom Beckett's camp. Tom was rolled in his blankets in the shelter of a thick clump of spruce. He was awakened by the startled barking of his huskies. Seeing the two men approaching, Tom threw aside his blankets and got to his feet. Howdy, strangers. Traveling kind of late at night, aren't you? Your name Tom Beggin? Yeah, that's right. What about it? Get your hands up. Hey, what's the idea? Shut up and do like I tell you unless you want a hole in your head. Yeah, that's better. Now turn around. All right. Now start walking over to the edge of the gorge. What are you aiming to do? Shut up and get going. As Tom approached the gorge... Bronson suddenly raised his hand and brought his gun butt smashing down on Tom's head. All right, Breed, grab his leg. Yeah, I got him. Now, I will carry him over to the edge. All right, let's heave him over. Let him go! You... you think him dead? (laughs) If he ain't dead, he's in mighty poor shape right now. Anyway, what's the difference? The fall didn't kill him. You'll freeze it up before he comes to. Come on. Hey, look. Someone come. Holy smoke, you're right. You think him see what happened? I don't know. He'll probably show up pretty clear in this moonlight. We better not take any chances. Now, come on, let's clear out of here. We hitch up Beckett's team? No, there's no time for that. We'll mush down the trail a ways and find ourselves a good hiding place. Then we'll wait and see what happens. Come on. Line, Carlo. Line the team. Now, mush. Mush, you husband. Ten minutes later, Sergeant Preston arrived at Tom's camp. Though he had glimpsed figures moving about far up the rise, he had no idea what had happened. But he was prepared for trouble. Bull King! Come on, King. Let's find out what's going on here. The sergeant's glance took in Tom's empty bedroll and the huskies straining at their traces nearby. He also saw footprints leading away to the brink of the gorge and the fresh tracks of a sled heading out of sight along the trail. Even though he guessed what had happened, he said... Come King. The sergeant patted Tom's blankets. Find him, boy. Which way to go? King sniffed the blankets, then gave a sharp bark and trotted away in the direction of the footprints. Sergeant followed him. A moment later, King stopped on the edge of the gorge. So they threw him over the edge, eh, fellow? If Phil Rockland's behind this, he'll pay for it. Steady, King. Come back, fellow. We'll go after them later. Right now, we've got to go down there and find Tom's body. There's a chance he may still be alive. The southern entrance to the gorge lay only a short distance away. The sergeant drove there on his sled, taking one of Tom's blankets with him. Before entering the narrow defile, he paused to light a hurricane lantern. 
No trail down there, fellow. We'll have to pick our way along. After lighting the lantern, Sergeant Preston held out the blanket once more for King to sniff. He's down here somewhere, King. Now, I want you to find him. Got the scent, boy? All right, lead the way. Push your husky. Push! Meanwhile, when Bronson and the half-breed had heard Sergeant Preston's team heading away in the opposite direction, they had ventured out of their hiding place to scout out the situation. In one hand, Bronson carried a rifle. Where in thunder do you suppose he's going? I am going to Mouth of Gorge. Try find Buddy. By golly, I bet you're right. Come on, let's get back to Beckett's camp. The two men returned to the scene of the crime. They crept close to the gorge and peered over. The depths below were hidden in inky darkness. But in the distance, they saw the flickering light of a lantern advancing along the floor of the gorge. Look, down there. Him come this way. Yeah, yeah, you're right. We'll wait here till we hear his team come a little closer. Then we'll let him have it. A moment later, Bronson moved his rifle into position. As he did so, the barrel of the gun dislodged a few pieces of gravel. Inside the narrow, steep-walled gorge, the sergeant heard the sound. In a single movement, he flung the lantern against the rocks and dropped to the ground. A split second later, a rifle shot thundered into the gorge. King, King! King swung the team to the right, close to the cliff wall, where the sergeant knew they'd be protected by the rocky outcropping. Oh, your huskies! Oh, no. Keep them down, King, so they won't get hit. In the darkness, the sergeant drew his gun and returned the fire. Hastily, the two crooks drew back from the edge of the gorge, out of sight. I don't think they'll risk any more shots, not for a while, anyway. In the meantime, you've got to find Tom. He must be pretty close to his body. Find him, King. A moment later, a low whine announced that King had discovered Tom's body. The sergeant moved cautiously in the direction of the whine. His hands groped in the darkness. Oh, good boy, King, you found him. Oh, thank heavens he landed in a snowdrift. I'll try his pulse. King, it's still beating. Let's see if he has any broken bones. Swiftly but gently, the sergeant's <laughs> hands probed for possible fractures. Seems to be all right. I guess the snowdrift saved his life. <laughs> the sergeant dragged Tom back to the sled. He wrapped him in a blanket and forced a little brandy down his throat. Gradually, Tom began to recover consciousness. Ooh. Easy, Tom. Quiet. This is Sergeant Preston. What happened? Where am I? We're at the bottom of Devil's Gorge. You got thrown down here. The men who did it are up on the rim of the gorge right now, waiting to shoot us when we come out. Holy smoke. What are we going to do? Now listen, Tom. I have a plan. This is what we'll do. A short time later, Bronson and the half-breed heard the sergeant's dog team moving northward along the floor of the gorge. Ah, uh, him go away. He head up gorge. Yeah, he probably thinks he can give us a slip by going all the way through the gorge. <laughs> you know, we'll see about that. You'll have to travel pretty slow down there in the darkness. We'll go get our team and hightail it up the north end of the gorge ourselves. And when he comes out, we'll be all set for him. It was nearly an hour later that the two crooks heard the sergeant's team emerging from the north entrance of the gorge. They were hiding behind a group of boulders at the mouth of the rocky defile. Bronson's gun was already leveled to shoot. <laughs> Here he comes now. But a moment later, Bronson's anticipation changed to dismay. Hey, where is he? And no one drives sled. Get your hands Look out! You. Whirling around, Bronson saw the Mountie emerge into view from a thick clump of trees 20 yards away. There he is, shoot! He raised his gun to fire, but the sergeant shot first. Go, my arm! Don't try anything. Next time, I'll shoot to kill. Hey, where did you come from? How did you get up here? I had my lead dog take the team through the gorge. Without a driver? The team doesn't need a driver with King in the lead, do they, King? That still doesn't explain how you got up here. While you two were traveling all the way to the north, end of the gorge, I came out the other way. How uh, you get here so fast? I hitched up Tom Beckett's team, left him about a half a mile back down the trail. From now on, I'll ask all the questions. You're both under arrest in the name of the Queen. The following morning, a small group of friends had gathered at Duncan McNeil's house in Dawson for the wedding. The old mine owner had been carried into the living room and propped up with pillows to witness the ceremony. A hush fell over the group as Elaine McNeil, pale but calm, entered the room. The Reverend McPherson spoke to Phil Rockland. You're a mighty lucky man, Mr. Rockland, to win such a bride. Don't I know it? Silently, Elaine came forward and took her place at Phil's side. The ceremony began. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together in the sight of God and in the presence of this company 
to join together this man and this woman. <laughs> What's the meaning of this interruption? Sorry, sir, but I have official business with the bridegroom. Buckland, you're under arrest in the name of the Queen. The charge is attempted murder. What's the meaning of this, Sergeant? Well, you can't come in here this way Never and break mind up my... bluffing, Rockland. The two men you hired to kill Tom Beckett have already confessed. Sergeant, what are you talking about? Tom was killed down in Cuba. Oh, no, he wasn't, Elaine. As a matter of fact, he's standing right outside the door. What? Would you like to see him? Oh, yes, please. Come on in, Tom. Tom! Hey. Oh, Tom, you come back. Oh, it's a wonderful scene. Well, what do you know about that, Sergeant? You've broken up the wedding ceremony, and the bride's actually happy about it. Looks to me as though the ceremony may continue with a new bridegroom, now that this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure. Fellas and girls, the Yukon is a pretty rugged place to live. But look, whether you live in the great northwest or here at home, you need plenty of food energy. Yes, and if you were to ask Sergeant Preston, you can bet he'd agree that a good breakfast is a mighty important source of food energy. So here's good advice. See to it that you eat the kind of breakfast you need every morning. You'll want to include a big He-Man's bowlful of delicious Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice with milk or cream and fruit. Try it. Wheat or rice shot from guns tastes so crisp, tender, delicious, it's always a tempting treat. What's more, it furnishes added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. For a nourishing, tenderly crisp, delicious breakfast, get Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice in the big red and blue Quaker package. Get them tomorrow. Remember, they're never sold in bags or bulk. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the return of the fugitive. When the constable at 40 miles sent for my help, the journey there through a blizzard was bad enough. But when I learned that King and I had to continue on, in the blizzard, to trail a fugitive from a murder charge, I knew we were in for quite a time of it. Matters became even worse when I had to depend on the man I was hunting to save my life. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure, Friday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from guns. Remember, for delicious hot breakfast, enjoy Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. And here's why Quaker Oats is called the giant of the cereals. There's more growth, more endurance in oatmeal than any other whole grain cereal. So make your hot breakfast nourishing Quaker Oats. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is Jay Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.